everyone. My name is Danielle Grego, and I'm the Education Program Coordinator with the State Historical Society of Missouri. Thank you for joining us for today's program, Missouri Mysteries, Chapter 4. Just in time for Halloween, Assistant Director of Research Sean Rost is exploring the curious case of Norma E. Short. If you've missed our other chapters of Missouri Mysteries, you can catch them on demand on our website, shsmo.org. Today's program, along with all of our other events, are made possible thanks to our generous support of the State Historical Society of Missouri's members and donors. Thanks for joining us, and now I'll hand it over to Sean. Thank you very much, Danielle, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, some of you have probably been through all of the Missouri Mysteries with us um, so far in our fourth edition here. And if you are a, a new person to join us, I'll cover a little bit about what Missouri Mysteries is before we jump into our story here. Um, since 2020, Missouri Mysteries has been kind of a focus every October on an unusual story, legend, um, you know, uh, various theories about different Missouri mysteries. Um, we looked at everything from Momo the Missouri Monster and the Hornet Spook Lights to the Piedmont UFO incident in 1973 and the Carcagni. In each of those editions, we've basically looked at the legend behind um, the creature or the mystery, mystery. We've looked at the history behind it and the origin behind it. Um, and finally, kind of discussed various theories that are connected with these, with these stories about people who are trying on one hand perhaps to debunk it. And on the other hand, perhaps trying to give credence to what is going on in these various scenarios. For today's edition here, chapter four, we're going to look um, at a story covering mysterious lights in the skies and UFOs, but we're going to do things a little differently. Instead of a singular story, we're going to focus in on an individual, Norma E. Short, and really the, the story of her life and her involvement with a publication called Skylook. Now, the curious case of Norma Short really involves not just simply her involvement in all of this, but my own personal quest in many ways as a researcher and historian to find out more information about her. Um, it's It was difficult in a lot of ways to find more information about her. Um, and I'm going to kind of cover elements of her life that were kind of uncovered in various portions of this research. So let's begin now with a curious case of Norma E. Short, pictured here from a newspaper article from August 5th, 1973 in the Sedalia Democrat. Now, in the recent interest um, regarding congressional hearings involving UFOs and Missouri's decision to name Piedmont, Missouri, down in Wayne County, the UFO capital of the state regarding the 1973 Piedmont Lights incident, I was intrigued by the idea of doing another Missouri Mysteries on UFOs and unidentified flying objects and lights in the sky. Um, and in the course of going through various newspapers trying to find more information, in, 19, in an article from 1972, I came across the name Norma E. Short um, in her connection with a publication called Skylook. Initially, my plan was to figure out where Skylook is at, perhaps find some copies of it, and ultimately figure out if any Missouri UFO stories could be found in the pages of Skylook. What I quickly found out, however, was Skylook was not just simply something that might have information on Missouri, but Skylook was very much a Missouri creation in of its own right. Norma Short herself is a Missourian. Um, at the time that she was publishing and editing Skylook, she was living in the town of Stover, Missouri, in Morgan County. So now I was really intrigued. I needed to know more about Norma Short. And yet, this information eluded me in a lot of ways. As a researcher for the Historical Society and a historian, we are regularly asked to kind of find out information about a historical subject matter, a, an event in time, or even an individual. And yet all of my usual paths to finding out more about Norma E. Short came up empty. I looked through the census records and there was no Norma E. Short from the 1950 census back in time living in Stover, Missouri. When I went to city directories for Stover and, and phone books, there was an Arthur Short and there was a Donald Short, but there was no Norma Short. Finally, you know, I looked through uh, various elements of newspaper searches and database searches. And again, Norma E. Short only appeared in connection with Skylook, but nothing earlier than that in the town of Stover, Missouri. I was perplexed in a lot of ways. Who is this Norma E. Short and how do I find out more information about her? And then by chance, I came across an article um, in the August 5th, 1973 edition of the Sedalia Democrat, which provided more information. 
It discussed the fact that this Norma E. Short, which I had found in some newspaper articles from 1972, was the publisher and editor of Skywork, and it provided detailed information beyond just simply what had been in those earlier newspapers. In the earlier editions, they had said that she had been a mild manner retiree. They had talked about the fact that you know UFO sightings were on the rise in a lot of portions of the United States. And for her, she wanted to get to the bottom of it, and she wanted to provide information and curate that information for interested individuals. And this article from August of 1973 really opened up a little bit of the door, a crack perhaps, to kind of find out more information about who Norma E. Short was. Here's a, just a little excerpt from that newspaper from 1973 there. It notif notifies the reader that Norma E. Short is a UFO zine editor for Skylook, a special, special interest magazine for UFO buffs and information for monthly publication comes from co contributions from all over the United States and the world. And if you are an interested, and if you're a UFO enthusiast, then turn to Skylook, it says. Magazine is based in Stover, Missouri. Now, over the course of reading this article, which was, was rather lengthy, I found out that Norma Short had been, been editing Skylook for, for a number of years at that point. Okay, I, I knew that information. And she was, again, a mild manner retiree who was interested in that. Um, and it began to kind of slowly piece together a little bit of her life. And I came across a rather interesting piece of information that was that first real step towards finding out who Norma E. Short was. She was quoted in the newspaper as saying, I worked on the Salem Post when I was younger, and at that time I would have rather been a reporter than president. Well, now I had my first lead there. Norma E. Short from Stover, Missouri, had originally been employed as a reporter with the Salem Post. Now, question there are a lot of Salem's in the United States for, you know, Halloween and spookiness. You could point out Salem, Massachusetts. You could point to, you know, Salem, Oregon, perhaps is another Salem. But you might also know that there's a Salem, Missouri, located in Dent County. So by chance, I happened to look into Salem and look at newspapers in Salem. And lo and behold, there was a Salem Post that had been published uh, over a number of years there in the community. So I began to get on newspaper databases and type in, you know, Norma. Salem Post, anything I could find. And I came across a rather interesting connection that led me down a, a further uh, bit of information. For you see, in the 1940s, there was a, a portion of the Salem Post newspaper dedicated to a section called The Feminine Slant on This and That by Norma. Okay. This intrigued me, right? Who is this Norma? Same name as the woman I'm looking for. And I began to dive a little more into it. And it said that this Norma uh, was a gal Friday, as they called her for the newspaper. She did a lot of work in and around the newspaper, running the printing press, being a clerk. And finally, in 1940, her name is attached to this feminine slant. Now, the feminine slant was not new to the Salem Post. In fact, it had been published since 1937 um, in that newspaper, originally um, under the byline of Dixie Winters. Uh, after Winters left, um, there was no name attached to it. And then finally, in January of 1940, by Norma is attached to that. Over the course of three years, this Norma um, provided various commentaries on local affairs, everything from information about schools to history and literature, um, news of the world in some capacities, and even covering, you know, the evolution of World War II as it impacted the home front. You know, these clippings here show, you know, everything from Red Cross nursing classes to what is going on over at Fort Leonard Wood to how even the War Production Board is dealing with garments and clothing and things like that in a time of rationing. Uh, I became very intrigued by this, Norma, and wanted to know who she was and what connection there might be to this Norma E. Short from Stover, Missouri. Well, I found out that Norma was uh, was actually Norma Rouse, uh, R-O-U-S-E, um, and that she had lived in and around this area of Salem um, for a good portion of her adult life. In fact, the 1940 and 1930 census lists her as a reporter for the newspaper. So now the Norma, the unknown Norma, um, had a last name, Norma Rouse. And in diving through Norma Rouse, I found out that she had been born originally in Saint jo around St. Joseph, Missouri in 1907. The 1910 census finds her in uh, St. Joseph, 1920. She has moved with her family, uh, John and Molly Rouse, uh, to Marion County, uh, up near where Hannibal is at now, where John was working as a carpenter. And finally, in 1930, the family had moved down to Salem, uh, where he was working as a farmer, and she was, was working as a newspaper reporter. Now, 
Over the course of this information, I, I again was intrigued and wanted to know more about this Norma Roust, hoping that this perhaps might be uh, the Norma E. Short I was hoping for. Um, Norma Roust eventually leaves the Salem Post, and the Post gives a rather glowing um, kind of send off to her for her role in the feminine slant um, and her involvement with the Post over a number of years. And she kind of moves around South Central Missouri over the co course of the mid uh, period of World War II. She eventually works first uh, for the Selective Service Office. She gets a job at the Social Security Office, eventually moving over to Fort Leonard Wood, um, and finally coming back and working for the Bureau of Mines in Rolla um, over the course of, of a few years there in the, in the early to mid-1940s. And even as she left the Salem Post to work in these various jobs for the war effort, she continued to continue, inform uh, continued to contribute information to the feminine slant uh, through January of 1943. Uh, in fact, changing its name towards the end of that run to the feminine slant of Fort Winterwood, um, incorporating that information. Intriguing to me now was we have a newspaper reporter working for the Salem Post, different last name, obviously, but nevertheless, possibly our Norma E. Short in a lot of ways. And then I came across a very fateful piece of information that proved to be kind of the missing link in some ways of finding out who Norma Rouse was and who Norma Short was. And that was a publication in the Rolla Herald from April 17th, 1943. Um, and it identified a marriage way out in Bremerton, Washington, between a Lieutenant Donald H. Short, formerly of Rolla, and Norma E. Rouse of Salem. Um, now, going through all this information, it kind of confirmed some information that I was curious for. This Norma Rouse that was getting married was the same one that had been living with John and Molly Rouse in Salem, Missouri. Um, but now I needed to know who this Donald Short was, because is this the same Donald Short that was living in Stover at the time that I had searched the city directories looking for Norma originally way back at the beginning of my research? So I had to dig a little bit into him, too, to find out more information. So what happens is that Donald Short was born in Illinois in 1920, and his family eventually moves to Rolla there um, around the uh, start of the Great Depression. He graduates from Rolla High School in 1938 and eventually earns a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the Missouri School of Mine, now Missouri University of Science and Technology, in 1943. Um, during World War II, he enlists in the Navy, and he is stationed um, in various locations uh, with the Navy, at one time actually serving on the USS uh, Indiana. Um, and at the time, in 1947 of this marriage, he's actually working at the Bremerton Field there um, at the shipyards in, in Bremerton, Washington. Um, and from that point in time, Norma Short kind of disappears, as does Norma Rouse. Um, what, from the best of my estimates here, is that they essentially move around with Donald as he is stationed at different portions, uh, different places in the U.S. Navy. Uh, for a time being in Washington, later serving um, in portions of uh, Puget Sound, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and even the U.S. Bureau of Ships in Washington, D.C. Um, and this article from the Sedalia Democrat from July 7th, 1964 kind of provides a little bit more context here is he's retiring from the U.S. Navy after his uh, 20 years of service. Um, and in the very bottom of it, it alludes to the fact that uh, he and his wife are planning to spend the next several weeks with relatives in Stover. Um, and they plan to then move to the state of Arkansas. So again, intriguing there to figure out if this is the same person. But in all, in all seriousness, in a lot of ways, this was kind of the missing link that I was searching for. This kind of confirmed my suspicions that the Norma Short from Stover was the same person as Norma Rouse um, from Salem, Missouri. Now, while the Shorts are moving in and around the country in the 1940s and the 1950s and the 1960s, there are a number of things going on that will later connect with Norma E. Short's career with Skyla. If you're familiar with, you know, some elements of UFO history and unidentified flying object history, you'll know that, of course, in 1947, we have the incident in Roswell, New Mexico in that summer. Um, and soon after, a number of sightings happened across the U.S. and even in the state of Missouri involving lights in the sky, saucer shaped disks, kind of unknown uh, entities in the sky. Over the course of the 1940s and into the 1950s, 
this idea of you know space technology and UFOs really kind of corners a market in American society and American culture. You have movies about UFOs and space landings. You know, the day the Earth stood, stood still. Um, you have you know companies branding things as UFOs or aliens. You know, TV shows uh, are being connected with that as well. We can think of something like Star Trek as well. Um, you have Sputnik and 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 certainly the the race to the moon, the U.S. space race, in which you have the development of of Mercury and Gemini, and finally the Apollo missions to, to land a person on the moon at the end of the 1960s. And even in places like Kansas City, Missouri, as this kind of image shows here, you have individuals interested in this study of UFOs. Uh, this is a letter from the UFO Study Club of Kansas City, written to their members of Congress, inquiring them to look into this phenomenon of UFOs. It says, phenomena have occurred in our time which have created great confusion for our national security, our government, and our people. These phenomena assumed to have been of an unknown aerial nature. It followed that our national security agencies were principally the first to be concerned about their significance. So it inquires Congress to investigate these flying saucers, to provide context and information to the people, to their constituents about what is going on. Um, and as you can kind of see here, this letter is not just sent to one person. This is from the Thomas C. Hennings uh, Jr. Papers, who was a member of Congress from Missouri. But you actually see it sent to each senator and representative in Congress from Missouri, as well as from Kansas, as, as Kansas City kind of borders both states, as well as requests to forward this information to the governors of Missouri and to Kansas, as well as Vice President Richard Nixon and President Dwight D. Eisenhower. So pretty serious and significant stuff here. So all this is happening, all these questions about what is going on with lights in the sky and UFOs, around the same time that Norma E. Short and Donald Short moved to Stover, Missouri there in 1964. And by chance, on a particular day in 1967, Norma E. Short is contacted by a man by the name of John Cohn, K-U-H-N, who was a student at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Now, how he gets a hold of the contact information for short, uh, I do not know. How he was directed to her, I do not know. But they get connected, and, and he asked if she would be interested in editing a publication on UFOs. Now, one, you're reaching out to a person who was in newspapers, you know, 20 plus years earlier. But also, how do you know that this person has an interest in UFOs? And that was another great mystery in all of this is why? Why would she be involved in this UFO publication? Well, in the article from the Sedalia Democrat from, from 1973, it lists her as a UFO buff and that she soon accepted the offer because she was interested in the subject matter. Uh, when they ask her later on why, and the, asking the similar question, why be involved with the UFO publication, she told reporters that she believed there was more to the universe than just Earth and that it was possible for extraterrestrial life to land on, on, on the Earth. She said, quote, most of the things people think are UFOs are really just stars or planets, plan uh, plane lights or fireflies. But there are too many other sightings that are unexplained. We are going to the moon and will soon land on Mars. So if there is other intelligent life in the universe, we, why shouldn't they come and look at us? End quote. So very quickly, Norma E. Short becomes the editor and the publisher of this pu early publication. The original agreement was that she would collect the information, curate it, rewrite it, edit it, and incorporate it into a publication, and that Cohn would essentially make uh, copies of it, and he would then mail it out to interested individuals. Within two years, however, Cohn decides he can no longer take on this responsibility. It is just too much of his time. He needs to focus on his studies at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And the sole responsibility for this publication falls to Norma E. Short. Now, she could have very easily said, you know, I'm, I'm interested in this, but I'm not that interested in this. I, I can't handle this all alone. Um, she could have said, you know, I need a partner. I need someone else to help me with. But she decides to, to really carry it on on her own. She buys her own mimeograph machine, which for younger audiences, that's a very early version of a copy machine. Um, and she decides to not only publish and edit, but also to make the copies and to do the mailings. And she said after the facts, you know, quote, I cried over that first issue. I didn't know how to operate the mimeograph machine or even apply the ink, end quote. Um, but very quickly, 
she begins to develop this publication into what eventually is called Skylook. Uh, and I want to take a moment here to thank the, the staff of the Indiana State Library for providing a copy here of Skylook, which we're going to look through here a couple of pages for, uh, for, for some of the rest of the program here. Uh, generously providing a copy of that for me to be able to see the outlook and, and the layout of Skylook. These, these publications are not uh, widely available to a certain extent to the general public as they, as they once were. Um, and a lot of libraries in Missouri actually have the secondary edition of Skylook, which was later had its name changed to the MUFON uh, Journal, MUFON UFO Journal, um, which we'll talk about shortly here. So to get a copy of Skylook uh, was, was a bit difficult. So I, I really appreciate, appreciate the staff of the Indiana State Library for making that available to me uh, as I was working on this project. Um, in the course of the 1960s, as, as Norma Short is taking over this, Skylook was originally intended to be a publication geared towards uh, you know, those interested parties connected with kind of UFO clubs um, across the Midwest. And one of the biggest ones at this time um, is an organization that later mo models itself into what's called MUFON. Originally, it was the Midwest UFO Network. Uh, MUFON still exists to this day. It has now changed its name to the Mutual UFO Network, and it's based in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, but has regional offices and, and members uh, in a number of states, including in the state of Missouri. So relatively quickly, as Norma E. Short is taking on Skylook and now not only publishing and editing, but also distributing it, uh, she gets uh, connected with MUFON as Skylook becomes the official publication of MUFON over the course of that. And within a number of years, um, it has become not only the official publication, but is now serving about 700 subscribers every month. Um, and this is not just simply in Missouri or in the Midwest. Um, at one accounting of it, it was reaching 29 states it was reaching individuals in Canada, in Europe, and in Australia. So it is an international publication. And as such, Norma E. Short is crafting this publication to address um, a number of different subject matters. You can kind of see here in this kind of table of contents at the start of the first page of this August 1972 edition, um, you know, everything from the message from the director of MUFON, which was Walt Andrews Jr., um, to information about MUFON conferences, to various sightings and incidents across the United States, and even looking at globetrotting and, and international UFO incidents as well. Um, so she takes on a responsibility of collecting this information from newspapers and from, uh, from subscribers and other uh, connecting points and slowly editing it and bringing it to the general public. Um, and while the, at the time that the Skylook kind of reaches its zenith under Norma E. Short there in 1973 and 1974, um, there is a lot going on in Missouri. There is the incident in Piedmont in, in, in the uh, winter and in, in spring of 1973 there. There is also uh, the uh, development of a series of conferences for MUFON, one being held in Kansas City. And in fact, the Kansas City conference there in 1973 is when MUFON officially changes its name from the Midwest UFO Network to the Mutual UFO Network to identify this as kind of international presence. But let's look a little bit through this August 1972 edition to kind of see how Norm E. Short arranged this publication um, in her mind and how she put it on the paper. So <clears throat> kind of a first example here, we can kind of see um, reports of various UFO sightings in the state of Missouri, some of them current as of 1972, and some of them kind of going back a little bit farther. So this is an example of a woman in Knox City reporting sites of a glowing object uh, credited to Lon Moeller. Um, this other issue from, from uh, 25 years ago, uh, citing kind of what was happening in Missouri in 1947, particularly in the, in the town of Sedalia, um, not long after the, the Roswell incident there in 1947, uh, crediting Ted Phillips for that one. And actually Ted Phillips is one of the first significant contributors to um, uh, not only MUFON, but also to uh, the publication of Skylook as well. In fact, uh, he was one of the early kind of spokespeople for MUFON and for a lot of these UFO investigations, kind of citing the need to have, you know, more information about what is going on, more information about these various UFOs. And he, he's actually quoted in the newspaper as saying, quote, to an, the goal of MUFON is to inform the public of UFO sightings, encourage reporting of UFOs, and conduct scientific studies of the phenomenon, end quote. 
Finally, if you're a previous uh, viewer and listener uh, to Missouri Mysteries, you'll know in our first edition there in 2020, we had a short uh, kind of coverage of Momo, the Missouri monster in 1972, which was a, a Bigfoot sighting in the town of Louisiana, Missouri, and kind of along the Mississippi River Valley there. Um, Norma East Short has her own kind of short write up here on Momo here in the course of the summer of 1972 as well there. Now, like I said, MUFON is trying to reach out to a much wider audience there uh, over the course of, of the 1960s and into the 1970s. So even Skybook is going to have reports, not just simply from Missouri, but reports from other states. Here's a, here's a clipping from um, a sighting at an Air Force base in California and even sightings in places like Africa and India and Central Europe um, over the course of the, of the 1970s and in the summer and spring of 1972 as well. Uh, over the course of all of this, really, uh, Norma E. Short kept uh, her goal of disseminating this information, collecting this information, editing it, and dispensing it out to interested parties. Um, and when asked, you know, why do you do this? Why have you kept doing this over the course of several years? She said, quote, this is something I have built up and I enjoy doing. It gives me a chance to write. I guess I'm a newswoman at heart, end quote. Now, while she started the publication in 1972, uh, she eventually uh, decides to retire from the publication um, in 1974, her last edition being the January 1974 edition of Skybook. And she transitions into a, a kind of uh, editor emeritus role um, with Skylook. Um, it will continue on and it continues to continue on to this day in, in various iterations, usually kind of based in, and published out of the location of the editor or, or, a, or a kind of notable individual connected with MUFON for a long time. Um, it was published out of uh, Sequin, or Sequin, Texas, which was where Walt Andrews, the, the kind of founder of MUFON, had moved in 1975. And then, of course, it takes on the name MUFON UFO Journal at the same time, and Skylook um, is no more. After she leaves Skylook, Norma E. Short and Donald Short continue to live out the rest of their lives in the city of Stover. Um, she passes away in February of 1986, um, and uh, Donald passes away in August of 1988. Um, and even then, the intrigue kind of continues on after that point. Uh, one of the reasons why I could not find information about Norma E. Short um, after 1972-1973 was that she doesn't have an obituary in the newspaper. And I will, I will clarify here as a as historian and as a researcher, it could be out there. It certainly could be out there. And I, maybe I just didn't come across, across it. Maybe I didn't see it. Um, but in looking at issues of the Stover newspaper and even Versailles newspapers for February of 86, uh, I did not find information about Norma E. Short or an obituary for her to kind of confirm a lot of the information that I, that I had come across already. When Donald uh, Short dies in August of 1988, he does have an obituary in the Stover newspaper, um, and it kind of uh, covers a lot of the information and acknowledges that he was married to a Norma E. Short and that she had passed away in February of 1986, um, and that they have subsequently been buried, or at least he has been buried, in a, a cemetery in Dent County, Missouri. Now, if you go to find a grave today, you can find Donald Short's uh, tombstone located in the cemetery um, in Dent County, but you will notice that the name Norma is listed on there, but the birth and death dates are not listed on there. Again, adding to the mystery and intrigue. Again, lots of theories that could be attributed to that, but I thought that was interesting to point that out. Um, and really, that's the story of, of Norma E. Short. It was a fascinating story. Um, research project to work on for this Missouri Mysteries. And, and, and in a lot of ways, once I found out about her, I could not stop learning more information about her and kind of really trying to dig and find out more information, not just simply about her connections to Skylook, but also really about her career as a newswoman, as someone connected to the newspapers and her start in Salem, Missouri, and all the way up through Skylook and her role in all of that. And her role as a significant contributor to the study and research an understanding of UFO sightings in the United States um, in the latter half of the 20th century. So I thank you very much for joining me today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your presentation, Sean. Now I want to open it up to questions from our audience. 
Okay, we have some questions coming in. Um, David R. wants to know, is there any indication that her husband and his naval career may have contributed to her interest in UFOs? So that's actually a really interesting question. It's something that uh, my colleagues and I have discussed, actually, this kind of intrigue of like, what might he have known and how would that possibly impacted her own interest in UFOs? From what we can tell, and there's and there's not a lot available, there's just no direct connection. She doesn't reference it in any of her, you know, any of the interviews, especially the one with the Sedalia Democrat in 1973. It doesn't really come up in, in what I've seen, at, at least from Skylook um, in those publications. It just seems that she has an interest, and perhaps it's kind of just with the rest of American society there in the 1940s and 1950s and 1960s of kind of this unknown, these kind of UFOs, this kind of element of the space race. Um, so perhaps it comes from that. She admits herself to be a UFO, UFO buff. She admits herself to be kind of curious about the fact that there's a lot of unknowns still in the midst of even debunking some elements of the lights in the sky. Um, and that her goal really in a lot of ways was not to provide, you know, I think at one point she says, you know, stories of little green men, uh, but to kind of provide context of, you know, what are these things that people are seeing and, you know, what are the theories behind them in a lot of ways? So I think she certainly has an interest with it, but at no point did I ever come across. And again, I'll say there might be something out there that I that I, that I didn't see, but uh, that says that her husband's military career was what kind of shaped her UFO interest. But it's possible, I suppose. All right. And Hardy P wants to know, how did Norma collect her stories? Did she recruit them or did they come to her? It seems like what, what is, is kind of found in Skylook and what comes out in some of the newspaper articles was that she had kind of a, a number of newspapers she was collecting and that she was clipping stories out of um, to potentially add. I know there's a lot of, in some of the ones I was seeing, you know, uh, excerpts from Missouri-based newspapers that she was finding. So obviously connections to that. But it also seems like her connection with MUFON and with various UFO study groups also built up a subscriber list as well as kind of a connection point for a lot of these stories of people passing along newspaper clippings or passing along sightings to her for her to then edit and re rewrite and incorporate into elements of Skylook. So it certainly appears that she was getting quite a bit of mail at least uh, to kind of address these various theories and, and sightings and to put them in Skylook uh, over time. And Stephen B wants to know what inspired you to take on this research? I think in a lot of ways, it was just really the the curiosity of it. I mentioned it a little bit at the beginning, but, you know, in this job, we do a lot of research projects and you know, people sometimes ask us to, you know, find an ancestor um, and, or to find some information about a historical event. And, you know, we have a kind of a usual list of sources that we go to um, to find an information. And then sometimes we find them and sometimes we don't. Um, but it feels good when we do find them, I will say. But it was intriguing that all of my search efforts initially went up empty. I could find Normie Short connected to Skylook, but there wasn't a lot of information about her life. She wasn't coming up in the census or in city directories or even in newspaper searches prior to 1972 and 73. That intrigued me and I couldn't stop in a lot of ways. Like I, I couldn't just say, oh, well, from Missouri Mysteries, let's focus on another UFO story or something like that. I was like, I have to figure out who this Norma E. Short is. And as I came across more and more information, it was that kind of moment of, this is such a good story, it has to be told. Um, and I'll readily admit, there's more to the story. And I, and I encourage people, if they, if they knew Norma E. Short, um, if they know information about her, you know, to, to please share it, because I, I think there's more to the story there um, that could be told about her. But it was just simply the ability to, to the inability to find her at first and, and the ability on my end to just constantly search and search and search until these various pieces of the puzzle fell into place that really intrigued me and kept me going to complete the project. And John P. asks, is there any information about the 1973 UFO over Eastern Columbia? J. Ellen Hynek personally investigated and could not debunk it. So, yeah, Hynek is in Missouri a lot there, um, in, in, in especially in 1973. He's doing interviews with individuals in Piedmont during the Piedmont Lights incident. I'm not super familiar with the story about East Columbia. That is intriguing. 
Um, so I'm, I don't have a lot of information connected with that. I will say there was a number of investi investigations going on in 1973 in the lead belt up closer to St. Louis, um, even in portions of Southeast Missouri in the boot heel involving UFO sightings. So, so Heineck and other researchers uh, were in the state that summer and, and going through and investigating and, and kind of talking to people. So um, not no direct knowledge of that particular incident, but nevertheless, Heineck and others were in the state of that point doing a, a number of uh, UFO case studies uh, across the state. Sure. And Beth P. asks, um, recently Piedmont, Missouri, as you talked about, was declared the UFO capital of Missouri. What do we know about the location's multiple sightings? So Piedmont is interesting because it has recently been, been, been included as kind of this for the 50th anniversary as being um, this, this, this UFO capital of, of our you know, yeah, UFO headquarters in the state of Missouri that dates back to a kind of a photograph from, from a St. Louis newspaper of a billboard in, in the city of Piedmont kind of advertising that um, kind of the, you can check out the full story of that on um, Missouri Mysteries Chapter 2 on the SHSMO uh, YouTube page. But kind of the, the shortened version of that is that there was a number of sightings in and around Piedmont in February and March of 1973 um, from a number of individuals who were sighting um, strange lights in the sky. And you actually have um, so many that um, there begins to be an investigation of the area by various groups. Um, and eventually, uh, Harley Rutledge, who was a professor uh, at Southeast Missouri State University in Cape Girardeau, uh, begins to be part of the investigation team. And he becomes so fascinated by it that it actually makes him into a UFOlogist, as he, as he calls himself later on in life. And he publishes a book called Project Identification, which is actually available at the Historical Society's Research Library. If you want to check it out, I think it's about 200 pages, where he kind of walks through the various theories. He walks through his own connections and his own kind of experiences in and around Piedmont uh, over the course of 1973. Um, a really, really fascinating book. Um, and also check out the, the Missouri Mysteries Chapter 2 to kind of get more information. But it was a, a widespread series of sightings across the Lead Belt and, and across kind of southeastern Missouri there in, in the fall, and or I'm sorry, in the winter and, and spring of 1973. Um, and 50 years later, the state of Missouri has recognized it as kind of the UFO capital, the UFO headquarters, and kind of acknowledgement to what happened uh, 50 years ago um, this, this winter and spring. And uh, Katie C. wants to know if you have any topics locked in for your next Missouri Mysteries episode. <laughs> I get that question every, every time I do Missouri Mysteries. Um, so uh, I don't want to give it away right now. So it is a mystery. I will say that. Um, so I get a lot of, uh, people will send me ideas and, and they'll send me theories that they want me to look into. And, and, and certainly I kind of take those uh, very seriously and kind of work through those to kind of figure out something that works. We try to make sure that it's something that can carry an entire presentation, um, and that there's a little bit of history behind it as, as well. You know, not just simply the, 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 the legends and the stories told, but there's an origin and a history to it. And that there's various theories that we can talk about and really has a connection to Missouri history. So we've done a lot of focus on the 1970s uh, recently with a number of these Missouri mysteries, um, but really we've, we kind of look at the, you know, the 19th and 20th century as a whole um, and kind of look for you know, geographic diversity and regional diversity in our focus. You know, what areas of the state um, have unique stories? What areas of the state have we not covered yet? Um, so stay tuned next October, if you'll have me, I'll be back for chapter five. Um, and we'll see what it is at that point. But uh, it'll be something on Missouri Mysteries. It's, it's one of my favorite parts of the job. So I, I, I look forward to being back for, for Chapter 5 in 2024. All right. And we have Deborah G. who's asking, um, do you think that Norma's hometown newspaper might have her own uh, death notice? And were there any children from her marriage? Um, there are a couple of other questions, but I'll stop there first. Sure. Uh, it, it's difficult in a lot of ways. As far as I can tell from from Donald Short's obituary, there were there were no children uh, that that were listed, at least that I saw. Um, and in going through his obituary, I, I had to look in in the Stover newspaper. 
Um, and I, I tried desperately to go through the Stover, Stover newspaper. It's not a particularly lengthy newspaper. It was published weekly there in, in the 1970s. Um, and I ran basically uh, end of January through March of, of 1986 uh, for hers um, and came up empty. And I even went to the neighboring uh, Versailles newspaper, which is the next town over in Morgan County. Again, no luck in that newspaper either. And now, now I did find Donald Schwartz obituary there in 1988 through the Stover newspaper, which provided a kind of a some elements of tying up loose ends and kind of confirming some information. Um, but yeah, there was nothing in the original Stover newspaper that I that I could find. But again, I will I will say, you know, I might have missed it. That's a strong possibility. But I I, I looked over the newspaper twice and didn't see it. So it seemed at least that nothing was 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 covered in the newspaper and for various reasons i'm not sure um and the next part of the question um could there have been a divorce or separation and with no death records um might she not be there that's a, that's a good point that there is um a little bit of unknown um if you uh, go on the uh, missouri state archives website you know that they have the the death certificate database um, that goes up to about 50 years out. So that's currently in, I believe, 1972, maybe 1973 right now. So obviously she passed away in 86, so it's not going to be visible there. Um, in terms of divorce, uh, in Donald Short's obituary, uh, it lists that he was married to Norma Rouse and Norma E. Short um, in 1947, and that she preceded him in death in 1986. It, there's no reference in that particular obituary that they were separated or divorced or anything like that. Um, so that's kind of curious in that regard. I mean, there's a number of theories that I, I don't want to delve too deeply into for why that might have been that they that she does not have an obituary in the newspaper or that her her name is on the headstone but not her birth or death date. Um, but it's it's difficult to track. So in a lot of ways. It, his obituary identifies her as, as them being married and that her that she preceded him in death. So that's all I really have to go on. So that, it's a theory, certainly, but uh, that's just what I, what I have for right now. And Sam S. asks, we have the congressional hearings at the U.S. Capitol involving the UAP mystery and finding out what is behind it. Have any organizations been looking into unexplained cases in Missouri? So. There are a number of organizations, especially as we went through the research of this, especially in the 1960s and the 1970s. I mean, you had these various kind of UFO study clubs popping up and writing um, letters to their members of Congress and to the legislature. Obviously, MUFON becomes kind of that primary one there. It's it's originally connected with St. Louis um, and Illinois. Um, Walt Andrews is originally from Quincy, Illinois, is where he was living at when the, when the MUFON gets started. There's a lot of connections into St. Louis and Illinois early on before he moves to Texas. Um, and MUFON still exists to this day. So they're still actively doing uh, different investigations, um, both in the Missouri uh, chapter of it, as well as kind of the, the, the international headquarters there um, in, uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. So MUFON was the primary one that came up a lot um, in a lot of these newspaper articles. When you look up, especially in the 1970s, you know, UFO investigations, unexplained lights in the sky, MUFON is usually connected with that, but there were also other individuals, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but there was a gentleman from uh, Oklahoma City, from Oklahoma, who came not only to look at uh, Momo the Missouri Monster, but also was doing interviews of individuals in Piedmont in 1973 as well. So uh, Dr. Hynek, who was uh, up at Northwestern University, who, who had worked a little bit on Project Blue Book, was also doing interviews in, in Missouri in the 1970s as well, especially in 1973. So at least those three groups are actively working there in the 1970s. Um, and I know at least for MUFON, they, they still have an active presence here, even in the in the present day. So they're one that continues to work. And, and Harley Rutledge, Rutledge too, from, from CIMO, um, was a UFOologist after, the, after his time in Piedmont and, and continued to kind of write and focus on a lot of that too. So project identification from 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 his publication of the Piedmont incident is also was a, a critical research subject matter on UFOs as well. And we have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, Mark A asks, what was the most important um, source while you're piecing together this story? In a lot of ways, it really was uh, 
the, the the bits of information, I would say the 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 August 1973 article in the Sedalia Democrat carries a lot of importance because it opens that first door into an investigation about her life. Um, obviously, the the marriage, uh, I, the the marriage notice in the in the Rowell Herald kind of connected some dots between Norma Rouse and Norma E. Short. But I think that was particularly interesting for me really was uh, the articles in the Salem Post, kind of connecting that Salem Post reference from the Sedalia newspaper to what she was actually doing and finding out more about Norma Rouse, later Norma Short, as this newspaper writer, someone who was contributing significantly, not just simply with Skylook, but also with this um, you know, feminine slant of this and that and the feminine slant of Fort Leonard Wood. I think that was, that was really fascinating to see kind of what her interests were for that what she was writing on and how she provided really a, a key uh, element of community um, connectiveness in a lot of ways, writing about not just simply the war effort, but really um, local town information as well. So that was something that that proved extremely interesting in building this story out, which is this is not just simply Norma Short, uh, the UFO um, you know publication writer, but Norma e. Short uh, a lengthy career as someone in news and uh, someone in, in, in journalism um, who was contributing significantly to a number of subject matters in Missouri history. Great. Thank you, Sean. And thanks to our audience for joining in today. We hope that you join us for future programs. All of our programs are listed on the calendar tab of the shsmo.org website. So we hope to see you there. We hope that you have a fun, safe, and spooky October. Thank you.